Yeah. This is what an intrusive thought looks like. Man, I'm a pretty big fan of adult Legos, and this Zima Blade Nasket fits the bill. You got a little cage, an 80s Walkman, data snakes, HDMI to nightmare fuel adapter, and wait, you're not supposed to exist, right? A 16 gig DDR3 SO DIMM. Now I'm curious what's powering this Walkman, if I can find a way to open this critter. Reminds me of that puzzle box grandma had. All right, there we go. What do we got? An Intel Atom E3950. Four cores of fury from nine years ago. Now, if you think an N100's a wee slow, nay, it's a fire-breathing juggernaut compared to this 3950. Even the SoC in a Pi 4 runs laps around it. But this is a starter NAS, so maybe it'll be all right. Let's pop in the memory stick like so and snap this critter back together. Because the Zima Blade has a couple of party tricks, starting with dual SATA ports plus power that makes connecting drives wicked simple with the included cable. Then we got the tech tuber bait a Gen 2x4 PCIe hole. Now, I know shoehorning a 5090 in here would be a valuable data point, but I'm going to try quad ether noodles, a 10 gig fiber card, and something practical yet mysterious. Stick around for that, because first we need to assemble the kit. I'm using the latest in HDD tech available from the box in my closet, plus some screws, because the NAS kit didn't include screws and well, anyone learning about PCs, buying a starter kit has a box of M356s laying around, right? The included cable is kind of neat. It does data and power courtesy of this little fella that doesn't clip in place. So yeah, careful with that. And where's the second drive? I hear you calmly typing in the comments. Hear me out. The included power supply ain't going to power two spinny drives reliably. They upgraded it at the end of last month, but this is what I'm sticking with. Now why? If you walk outside of your home lab bubble, this is what contact with first NAS looks like. Inexpensive kit plus whatever you have laying around. So it's time to apply the electrons and let's see what happens. All right, time to punch some number digits into the address bar and hello Casa OS. Guess we need to create a user and password that's totally not Swordfish. Sure, give me those news bits. All right, it sees the spinny drive and internal storage. Let's create storage and see what happens. I am having defrag flashbacks. Oh, look, a beta button. Click. I guess that combined the drives. Beta's gonna beta. What about files? I do want to share the media folder, and I guess that worked. It is showing an SMB path. Yep, there it is. So what's the file copy look like? Around 50 megabytes a second. You know what? That's not horrible for SMB out of the box. Can I watch that video using a file browser? Womp, womp. How about with VLC on my tablet? Eh, all right, there it goes. It's hopping around. So what's this thing running? Debian 11, and it's missing 168 updates. And a gang of these are security. That's not good, because the dashboard says the system is fully updated. And Casa OS, well, it hasn't been updated since 2024. Not a good idea to use this for two-factor authentication or financial planning. Or at all. We're trying something else. Open Media Vault is a great option for people with a crippling fear of BSD. Simple, to the point, and hosted on SourceForge, so you know it's been around a while. But most importantly, actively maintained. I'm going to write the ISO to a flash drive in Houston. You seeing this? We need the OS and a keyboard. Yeah, easily solved with the USB hub, but let's live a little. I called this a party trick, but it does open up some unique options. Boot time. Now I want to have a peek at the BIOS real quick. All right, there's nothing crazy locked down. We got a couple of options to poke at. Good enough for me. Time for some vaulting. And this is just a trim down Debian installer. Couple of buttons and we're done. Reboot time. There's our IP address, so it's off to the browser where we can punch in our super secret login followed by a gang of updates and we might as well butter the spinning drive while we're at it. And look at that, a dashboard full of nastiness. And we're getting about 10 more megabytes per second on the SMB transfer right out of the box. And take a look at that CPU usage when copying a file. This is fine for a simple NAS, 
but running a gang of apps and containers would be a heinous misapplication of judgment. All right, Docker's installed. I'll have to make a guide since that was the opposite of straightforward, but Pi-hole appears to be up and running. I even pointed a couple of boxes in the studio at it, and there it is, blocking ads with gusto. So I'm calling this a win. All right, time for a bit of retro gaming with Laka Laka. It's a cool lightweight Linux distribution based on RetroArch, and no idea why the sound's knackered, but it's probably an easy fix, and it's not gonna stop. The Mega Gauntlet. Starting with the OG Game Boy, I had this on my DG1, and everything's going all right, but somehow the jumps just feel sluggish. Then again, 30-year-old memories aren't reliable, so don't put too much weight in that. Mega 2 got me into speedrunning before I knew it was a thing. It was one of those games I could just pop in and beat if I needed to kill a bit of time. And again, it's running great. Mega SNES seems to be more of the same, moving and pewing, no slowdowns. And of course, Ocarina of Mega is chugging along just fine on the N64. If anyone wants to defend this abomination, you're welcome to try down in the comments. Rocking over to PlayStation 1 and Mega Man 8, I forgot how shoddy the colors were in this game. Still, it looks awesome and it runs like a champ. So we're wrapping things up with X4 on the Saturn. You just gotta love Sega's preferred color palette. Dark. And I've never tried to emulate anything on the Saturn, but man, this is running great. The Intel HD 505 graphics should allow for hardware accelerated encode and decode with Jellyfin at least in theory. Direct streaming 4K60 video is no problem, and you know what, that's to be expected. So let's see what happens when we bust it down to 720p. Look at that encoder light up. There it goes. It's transcoding at 70 frames per second, so that's faster than real time, but also 20 FPS less than an Intel 100, and you do need to keep in mind that this is using slightly more power. I'm a firm believer that if a PC can run Debian, it can run any other distro. And no surprises here, installation was smooth and we're already at an accelerated Wayland desktop. Now I wanna check sound. We got left, left. not left. Front. So yeah, sound does work on Linux. The built-in gigabit ether noodle is good, but it is bring your own Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And look at that, the Intel 505 integrated graphics know how to Vulkan, kinda. Let's just say those retro games were kinda pushing things but we can get a look at the EMMC flash module. That's not bad. 150 megabytes on sustained reads and 120 megs on the writes. And the old spinny drive as well, sitting in a box for a decade, didn't do it any favors. But hey, now we can stab it with networking equipment, starting with this quad gigabit Intel card. Check that out, four ports ready to go out of the box, but I'm only testing one because lazy and I'd be surprised if this didn't work. But how about 10 gig? Hey, hey, there it is. Can this critter actually handle 10 gig? Let's check with the judge. iPerf. Ho, oh, ho, you go, little buddy. Yeah, you know what? That's close enough. Just keep in mind you have to remove the back plates and pro tip, don't use them as cup holders. Let's cook this 10-year-old Atom CPU with a delicate blend of Stress NG and Handbrake. Now I lost a bet here. I really thought the passively cooled 3950 would immediately thermal throttle but it barely cracks 60C, and it's sitting at 2 GHz on all cores. It kept this up for a solid 10 minutes without blinking, but it is sucking down around 20-ish watts. At idle, the clock falls to 800 MHz, and power usage hovers around 2.4 watts, which isn't bad, so really nothing to complain about here. Well, this is a mixed bag. You do get all the bits needed, for an inexpensive DIY NAS, you just gotta overlook the lack of a power button, a single USB hole, and no retaining clip for the drive's power cable, and I didn't forget about the lack of included screws for the drive cage. But I do like the dual 6 gig SATA and the PCIe slot that I thought it was a gimmick at first, but hey, it's given me ideas, and I like that. If we could only do something about this nine-year-old CPU. Hey, future vet, pull up the chart. Yeah, go ahead and hit it with a like and subscribe reminder while you're at it. All right, nice. As I was saying, you can see this Atom CPU while it's a calculator compared to the N100. And on top of that, it uses slightly more power. Also, CASA OS, the OS that ships on the blade, while it hasn't been updated, 
since 2024, and it's missing a gang of security updates. So you're going to need to be comfortable nuking that from orbit and installing a real operating system. So like I said, it's a mixed bag. But if you're NAS curious and don't mind a bit of tinkering, or maybe you just want a little x86 box with SATA and PCI Express, this will do the job. Links to everything in the description, and be sure to check out the full write-up over on Interfacing Linux, and let me know what you think about this weird little Walkman down in the comments, because that's going to do it for this one. So I want you to get out there and make something awesome.